Election College, Episode 21, The Election of 1848. In this episode, Polk achieves his goals, Marty disrupts an election, and some guy gets to be president for a day. Let's throw a political party. Face it, the political scene sucks, but did it always? It's time for election college, and class is in session. Now, your hosts, Jason Goff and Ben Smith. Hey everybody, I'm Ben Smith. And I'm Jason Goff. And thanks for joining us for another episode of Election College. Let's get into it. So James Polk. Yeah. He's the president. Mm -hmm. Uh, A little bit of background because he bursts onto the scene, does his thing as president, and then says, hey, I've done what I set out to do. Goodbye. Yeah, Yeah, so maybe we should go go back in time to – wouldn't that be crazy if more presidents did that? They were like, hey, I think I did a pretty good job, I guess. I guess I don't need another term. Yeah, and most presidents after their first term Uh really blow it. (laughs) (laughs) Good for Paul. Yeah, so back to 1844. He's the newly elected president. He sets out to do four objectives, and they are... Number one, reestablish the independent treasury system. So basically, the system ensured that all public revenues, okay, they were retained in the treasury building Mm -hmm. and in little sub-treasury buildings around the U.S. So it basically limited the amount of credit that was doled out, and you know how that goes. We like to spend money, whether we have it or not. So the system was eventually replaced in the early part of the 20th century. But there it was, 1844. Polk said, hey, let's reestablish this thing. Can, so you ima- can you imagine how different our economy would be if that had continued to be the case? I know. Have yeah. you ever tried to pay cash for stuff? Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Number two, reduce tariffs. And traditionally, the Whigs and Republicans were very much for higher tariffs. And the Democrats were for lower tariffs. And the goal of tariffs uh, wasn't and isn't really very controversial. The object, right, it's to raise money to pay for the federal budget. It's not complicated science or anything. But Jefferson, uh, Jeffersonian and Jacksonian Democrats both said that the tariff should really only be high enough to pay for the government's bills. And otherwise it hurts the consumers. Also makes sense to me. And the Whigs and Republicans said, no, we want higher tariffs so that we can encourage and protect the industry and industrial workers. But, you know, Polk's like, no, eh, let's get them lower. Oh, that was very noble of everyone there. Mm-hmm. So point number three, hey, let's acquire some or better yet, all of the Oregon country. So Polk, member was all about Manifest Destiny. I love that name. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know how that belief. Okay, so it's America's destiny to fill the North American continent with uh, basically the white people's values and so on. And there's still this dispute going on with the British about where the U.S. ends and uh, British Columbia, Canada. What do you want to call Canada at this point? Uh, how about Canada? Okay, yeah. so we're going to call Canada, Canada. And the Democrats on the extreme side, held the view that the U.S. should extend its border all the way up to the 54th parallel. Yeah, and the British extreme view was like, no, not the 54th parallel. Uh, The British want from the 42nd parallel north. So the British are calling the disputed area here the Columbia District, and the Americans are calling it the Oregon Country. And in 1846, the British and Americans finally came to the agreement that the border should fall on the 49th parallel. Uh, Polk really wanted territory, not war. So that's the reason for the compromise. Yeah, and then there's there are actually lots of subsequent border disputes. Uh, there's the Pig War, which is my favorite name of any war. It's hilarious. You yeah. need to, I think, um, Stuff You Missed in History Class yeah. or one of those had... Had an episode about that. It's pretty awesome. So number four, he wants to acquire California and New Mexico from Mexico. And long story short, he does it. Yeah. So people begin calling Polk Young Hickory because he was like 
Old Hickory, mm-hmm. and um, I guess that's the reason they called him Young Hickory. I would imagine, yeah. And they also called him Napoleon of the Stomp for uh-huh. his speaking skills. Uh huh. Um, I guess you can Google that to find out why. <laughs> so, like what he said, Polk accomplishes what he set out to do as president and goes home and enjoys the shortest retirement of any president. He dies three months after leaving office. Ugh. Well, he gets buried in the state house grounds in Nashville, Tennessee. Did you see his grave when you were there by chance? No. No. Okay. Just curious. I didn't see much of anything. You're it's in a conference. Hickory. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> so we've talked about presidential succession quite a bit here on the podcast, right? Yeah. And we've seen other people ride on other people's coattails, right? Woo-hoo. Yep. Okay. And so who's the Democrat that's going to ride on Polk's coattails? Well, everyone knows that. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Lewis Cass. Oh, Lewis Cass. I've heard about him so much as one of our esteemed famous presidents. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. So you ready to talk about the election of 1848? I think it's only appropriate. Okay. So you remember all the stuff that Polk had accomplished during his presidency? Yeah. We talked about it about three minutes ago. Yeah. So the Whigs were just, <laughs> they were against just about everything that Polk stood for. And the wars with Mexico and the annexation of a new territory and other policies that Polk uh, saw all the way through to fruition are established. And that had been previously what the Whigs were all negatively talking about. So now they're like, well, we got to find something else to talk about. Yeah. So if you can't beat them, nominate the general who won Polk's war. (laughs) The Whigs nominate General Zachary Taylor. And Taylor didn't speak out against Polk or his policies. Um, He wouldn't really toe the Whig Party line. But here's the big kicker. The Democrats would most certainly win if the Whigs didn't nominate him because enough Democrats liked him that, you know, it really mattered. So that's exactly what they did. The Whigs nominate General Zachary Taylor. Strategery. Strategery. Yes. So the Whigs really had to shift their attention to the new issue of whether slavery could be banned from the new territories, and that's just what they did. So Taylor was from Louisiana, and both parties actually courted him and wanted him to be their candidate. And here's the really funny thing. Uh, He never voted prior to the 1848 election in which he was running. (laughs) (laughs) I, You know, these guys just would not have done very well. Yeah. In our modern system. It's... It's almost like that should be a requirement. You have to have voted in every election you were able to vote in in order to be elected president. Wow. Yeah. Like, I'm part of an organization where we have officers, and I always say, if your dues are not current, you can't be an officer. I mean, that's not an official rule, but that's my opinion. What if you had to vote (laughs) in order to be voted in? Uh, that'd That'd be kind of fun. Right. Hey, you know what we should do? What's that? Remember Marty? We should we should talk about Marty. Man, Marty just keeps coming back time after time. <laughs> He's time like time after time. Yeah. Are we gonna have to pay for that? No, I don't I, I don't think so. Okay. So Marty. Uh-huh. Marty Van Buren. Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren the fifteenth. Yes. He seeks the Democratic nomination and doesn't get it. Instead, the Democrats nominate none other than Lewis Cass. Right. And Cass uh, was actually a governor and a senator at different points from Michigan. And he was the Secretary of War under Andrew Jackson. And he was also an ambassador of France. And if you look up his picture, if you Google his picture, he'll mess you up. (laughs) You'll be terrified for the rest (laughs) of your life. So the Democrats decide that they'll be silent on the issue of slavery. And when Cass was suspected of having pro-slavery leanings, many anti-slavery Democrats walk out of the Baltimore Convention and begin the Free Soil Party. Man, they just leave the whole convention. Like, what now? Anyway, the Democrats have Lewis Cass, and the Whigs have Zachary Taylor. And remember those anti-slavery Democrats we just talked about 30 seconds ago? Yeah, they, they're the ones who walked out of the convention in Baltimore. <laughs> They nominate Marty Van Buren as their candidate. Yeah, so Marty is like, hey, I'm old and a little, okay, no, a lot. I'm really angry. I'm old and crotchety. (laughs) And 
the Democratic Party, they just totally dissed me. So I hate Lewis Cass. Yeah. I hate the Democrats. And he knew, he absolutely knew beyond the shadow of a doubt, of a doubt that when he runs on the free soil ticket, it would split up the Democratic vote and give the election to the Whigs. You have to really hate somebody for the country that you once presided over to knowingly make them go a different way than what you believe in. Yeah, he's like, if I can't have it, ain't nobody going to have it. That's right, except for the Whigs. Yeah. Uh, it turns out that the pivotal issue that threw the election to... Spoiler alert, the Whigs was that the Democrats behind Lewis Cass really supported his views of popular sovereignty, the doctrine of pop- popular sovereignty. And this doctrine pretty much would have allowed voters in the territories to determine whether or not to make slavery legal instead of having Congress decide. And that is not really terribly popular for a lot of people. Yeah. So. The election really is between the Democrats and the Whigs, but there was a third and fourth party, the Liberty Party, remember? Well, wouldn't it be a fourth and fifth party because the Free Soil Party? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I like to think of the Free Soil Party (laughs) kind of as the 2.5. Yeah, I'm backpedaling. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, the fourth and the fifth, the Liberty Party Uh and the Native American Party. Now, that's not to be confused with our current term, Native Americans, but they held conventions but they didn't really have any consequence on the national election. How do you like that? Your spot in history is a blip that we just said has no consequence on the election. Aww. Sorry. Hey, so the Whigs are united. <laughs> the Democrats are divided. So it makes yeah. for an interesting turnout. Uh, Zachary Taylor wins 163 of the 290 electoral votes. He was only 79,000 votes shy of a majority. So... Taylor was actually elected as a minority president with only 47% of the popular vote. Thanks a lot, Marty. You've really (laughs) screwed things up for the Democrats, you crotchety old man. (laughs) (laughs) So one historian said about this election that, quote, practically the only thing that was decided was that a Whig general should be made president because he had done effective work in carrying on a Democratic war. Crazy. So Taylor succeeds Polk as president, right? So Polk's in, then he leaves, and Taylor's elected, and he comes in, and that's just how it works. I mean, one right after the other. Yeah, but Ben, you, you of course, remember David Rice Atchison, right? Um, who? Yeah, David Rice Atchison. He was a senator from Missouri. He was a Democrat. He was, he was the president pro temp. Uh, who? Yeah, um, David Rice Atchison. Oh, okay. Yeah, now I remember. Yeah, the yeah. guy from Missouri. Uh huh. Democrat. <laughs> Polk's term. <laughs> Polk's term ends at noon on March fourth, which was a Sunday. Yeah, and Zachary Taylor, he was a real, you know, kind of religious guy, and he refuses to be inaugurated on a Sunday. So, Zach, Zachary Taylor, by the way, Zachy, Zachy. Uh, doesn't become president until noon on Monday, March 5th. So that's like a day in between when he should have been and when he does. Yeah, and Polk is like, I'm done. And there's no president. Yeah. So <laughs> so Atchison never acknowledged that he was president. But in the terms of the succession to the presidency, if there's no P or VP, as it were. Um, Yeah, he was kind of the man in charge. But he actually said uh, that he slept most of the day on Sunday because he was resting from a busy few days in the Senate. So, yeah. So not only did he never recognize that he was the president, even though he technically was, the U.S. government doesn't acknowledge it either. And this is really humorous to me. Uh, In spite of no one really thinking, oh, yeah, he was the president for a day. There's a museum that opened in his honor, um, and the owner of it claims that it is the country's smallest presidential library, and the government doesn't recognize it, but it opened back in 2006, and it's called the Atchison County Historical Museum in Atchison, Kansas. That's awesome. (laughs) So that is, I actually really, 
I really want to go to Kansas now to see that presidential museum because aren't presidential museums made up of things about the presidency oftentimes? Yeah. So So there'd be not a lot there. He's got a bed. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so even on his gravestone, it's kind of funny because this must have been added much later, but on his gravestone, it does say uh, president of the United States for a day. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I'm sure he would appreciate it. Um, the fact that that's what he's best known for. Absolutely. I'm sure he's a really nice guy. He probably was. Hey, we're nice guys, right? I, I mean, I think. I think you're a nice guy. Hey, yeah. I think you're a pretty nice guy, too. And I like to think that our listeners, you are nice people. And yeah. every now and then we get to hear from you. That's right. Zero and 182 says, Great research and presentation. A great podcast that breaks down the history behind how the presidential election process was designed, changed, and echoed in American culture. Yes, that is correct. That's what we do. That's awesome. We really appreciate it. And it really helps us when we hear from you because a lot of times... Ben and I don't really give each other very good feedback. That's right. I, I usually, <laughs> I just tell Jason, you're horrible. And he's like, no, you're horrible. And then that's all the feedback we have. Yeah. So. And then we start flicking each other's ears and yeah. stuff like that. It gets really uncomfortable for the rest of the family. And yeah, it's rough. So we really want to hear from you. We are over on iTunes. Of course, we have a Facebook page. That's right. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Election College. And like Jason said, leave us a review on iTunes. Hey, the other thing is, if you go to our webpage at electioncollege.com, at the bottom of the page, we have a spot where you can write to us. And we have received several emails lately that were very encouraging. One recently gave us a lot of good ideas for future episodes and different things to talk about, maybe even a spinoff podcast someday. So it really would be great to hear from you in more of a long form. If you have something to say you can't fit in the review, email us. That's great. Yeah, we kind of like you guys. And you kind of like us, apparently. Or at least you tolerate us, which is just as, <laughs> just as good in our opinions. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, hey, uh, anything else about the election of 1848? Nope. That's all for me. Cool. All right, guys. We will see you next week on Election College. This is Ben. This is Jason. And uh, bye. Bye.